and Deputy Whip Blazajewski is going to, his, his first year off of the Judiciary Committee, is going to testify on House Bill 5700. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It is great to be back to House Judiciary. Uh, good to see everyone here. Um, House Bill 5700 is the early voting bill. It's been something I've worked on for several years, and I just want to commend Common Cause and John Marion, and Secretary Gorbea, and, and Jason Martijan, who's here as well, Gonzalo Cuervo, um, for working on this piece of legislation. I think this is the year to do it. Um, we have an emergency mail ballot process right now that's no excuses. This would formalize it into early voting. There are 33 states that have early voting. Fleming and Associates did a poll, and 66% of Rhode Islanders support early voting. Under this bill, it'd be for 20 days with two weekends, um, which I think is, would be fantastic. But I think it's time for Rhode Island to, to be one of the states that has early voting. So I just, it's great to see everyone here today, and um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Representative Blazajewski. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Thank you. Could we hear from Jim oh, Vince? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Corvese. Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who else do you have to testify for this? We have several pages of witnesses. Or anyone from the Secretary of State's office or the... Is the Secretary of State's office? Yes, they are testifying. One of the elections? Okay, I'll wait. We've, we've got quite a few. We've got three pages, so... Okay, could we hear from Jim Vincent from uh, the NAACP of Providence, the Secretary of State's on this, Jason Martesian, and uh, Steve Brown from the ACLU. Jim, if you're ready, you can... Okay, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jim Vincent. I'm the president of the NAACP Providence Branch. And we are strongly in favor of this bill, in-person early voting. We know that roughly 46% of the country votes early, and we know that 66%, as just was mentioned, of Rhode Islanders are in favor of it. But for us, it's really important because we want to make sure that our community has as many opportunities to vote as possible. In our history, we've often despite the 15th Amendment, have been victims of, of poll taxes and, and, and literacy tests and, and all kinds of other voter suppression techniques. So we take voting very seriously, and anything that's going to make voting easier for our community, we are definitely in favor of, and especially when it comes to something that time has come. So we at the NAACP Providence Branch are, are proud to support uh, Nelly Gabea and we're proud to support all the people that are involved with uh, supporting in-person early voting, and we, we want to make sure that uh, this happens this year, and we thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any questions? Thank you. Jason? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Jason Martesian representing Secretary of State uh, Gorbea, um, speaking obviously in support of this legislation. also like to thank uh, Representative Blazjewski for his uh, support and leadership on this issue. Um, frankly, this is, the, I think, the third year we've had this bill before this committee. I will not be repetitive, as you, I know you have a lot of uh, folks speaking in support, and you've already heard some of the, some of the st statistics. Um, I know you also will hear from some folks uh, who have some concerns about the legislation. I just want to say that this, this bill is, is a product of a number of discussions with the local elections officials, uh, state elections officials, and members of the community who, who you'll be hearing from um, throughout the evening. I think it re represents a lot of changes from the initial version, which was a much longer early voting period with, with more weekends, uh, longer weekend hours, and longer hours in general. Um, we have, uh, and the Secretary has worked with the local officials, and I think we still have some work to do that we're willing to have discussions about making this uh, bill uh, workable for the local cities and towns. But I think I want to make clear that, and the Secretary wants to make clear, that early voting really is here today, quite frankly. Uh, I know it's under the emergency mail ballot statute, but Representative Chippendale um, mentioned it in his, uh, in his testimony on his piece of legislation. Um, 2016 saw really no excuse emergency mail ballots. So we had early voting in Central Falls. There was early voting in Westerly, although you, know, you, you didn't hear as, as much about it. Um, there was early voting across the state. 
state. In fact, in the uh, 2016 election, Rhode Island saw uh, over 15,000 people, uh, citizens, vote early uh, in emergency mail emergence through the emergency mail ballot period. That's up from um, a little under 6,000 in 2012. So that's one election cycle. Um, and nationally, you've heard the numbers. I think early voting is here to stay. What we're looking to do, and the secretary is looking to do, is put a formal process around early voting so that, frankly, elected officials, local elections officials, and state elections officials are prepared and able to uh, address the issues that are presented on Election Day and in, in advance of Election Day, and also address the needs of, of voters, quite frankly. Um, when you see nationally 46 percent of voters voting early in advance of Election Day, I think that means that people are, you know, have busy lives. 7 to 8 p.m. on one day uh, during a, a year, every two years, is challenging for people that issues come up. Having the convenience of voting early uh, in person in your, your, uh, in your city or town, I think, is addressing a need of folks who are really busy working, working um, in their daily lives. So this bill is really a, 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 a compilation of all these discussions. We will continue, of course, to work with, um, with the local elections officials, but we really believe it's time to formalize a process that's already there today and, frankly, has seen a threefold increase from 2012 um, to 2016 and bring early voting formally to Rhode Island to join 33 other states in the District of Columbia in having such a process. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. I thought Representative Corvese might have a question. Yes, I, about I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to temper my comments. Okay. Same thing. Uh, you and I are going to have a discussion about this privately because I don't want to take too much time from the committee. Sure. On the face of it, I think that it's a bastardization of the voting process and basically is a, a blueprint for voter fraud, legalized voter fraud. That's how I feel right now. Maybe you're going to change my opinion. Maybe you're not. Maybe we'll come to some accommodation or agreement. I'm a little confused, though, with, with part of the language. Um, it says on page 3, line 13, the in-person early voting period shall begin on the 20th day before a general or primary election and extend through 4 o'clock p.m., on the day before the general or primary election. Then on line 26, it says, effective July 1st, 2018, in-person early voting shall take place during normal business hours in each city or town on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of what? Of the early voting, of the early voting period. But it does not refer to that period. It should refer to the 20 days before. Because if not, it, the way I read it, and I am not Representative Knight, who has a much better grasp of law than I do, that tells me I can come in starting July 1st, and I can vote on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We put it, we, you know, we meant to put the uh, the section in the in a new in-person early voting section, which is referenced with the 20 days, and we we the 20 days comes from that's where the emergency mail ballot. I understand the time frame. Days. I don't have a. So problem. that's the in, that's the intent. Re uh, representative, that's okay, the intent, so I understand. Yep, we but can look at that. that does not say that. We, we're happy to look at that. I think the just so you, and, yeah. And, 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 and it is also repeated on line 32, effective June 1st, 2020, in-person early voting shall take place during normal business hours in each city or town on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. There's no reference to the 20-day period beforehand. I look at that, I figure I can vote in January. Sure. And, and the intent, uh, Representative, to just, just so you know, is, is to have that within the early voting period in the, in the July of... It's going to have to be changed. We'll, we'll, we're happy to... We're, we're, Mr. Chairman? We're, we're, happy to work, we're happy to work with and you And I'm going to tell you, and please don't take this personally, I have the greatest respect for Secretary Gobey. You know that. I have a great respect for you. And I'm not just saying that to placate you. I mean that sincerely. I don't say anything I don't mean. But that's why... I get concerned about the details for legitimizing voter fraud when you see language like this. So I think yeah. it's a reasonable feeling. We're happy to clarify that. When, and, and you and I, I know, are going to have some yep. more discussions about this. But Absolutely. with all due respect, just the idea of early voting in this manner, as opposed to emergency balance. I remember the days you had to go with a doctor's note. I know, I collected them. 
<laughs> and, okay? And, right. And I mean, I remember those days. Right. No. Okay? I understand completely. So what I'm saying to you is I really am concerned that formalizing this in statute is really opening up a tremendous can of worms for the establishment. And, 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 our, and our concern, uh, Representative, and I, and I think the, the local elections officials will, will, will agree when, it, when you speak with them, is that the, 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 the little under 16,000 folks that voted emergency, quote-unquote emergency, because there really wasn't any request for emergency mail ballots. It's similar to the no-excuse mail ballots where we have went to, I think, six years ago that was passed. We're saying we should have a formal structure in place so that everyone understands how to vote early, that, that what it exactly means, and that people are, are clear to understand. You're, you, I, I, and, we can and, look and, at the and issues. And I, and I yep. think having a formal structure in place is fine, but a formal structure where the, where the devil's more in the details and that the details are more spelled out and and and, and Really, you know, they, I don't care what anyone says. There is a significant potential for voter, voter fraud with loopholes, especially during 20 days of voting. We're happy to. We'll be, we'll be talking. We're happy. We're happy to continue the conversations. Absolutely. Thank you, Representative Flippy. Is it the, your office's position that this will shift more pers more people into voting early? Well, we've seen in other we've seen in other states, and again, the national numbers are 46 percent of voters who vote in, in advance of election day. So we do believe there will be similar to when we moved to over this last election cycle, really not really emergency mail ballots. You saw a threefold increase in voters voting, almost a threefold increase voters voting early in Rhode Island. We do believe that more people will vote early. Yes. And so I didn't see this in here. Would you need an ID to vote early under this current bill? So th what's different, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Res Representative, what is different um, in this version than prior versions? Prior versions was basically um, using, incorporating the mail ballot process, which was, which is how emergency voting is done today. This uh, process that we're proposing, and we have talked to the local elections officials on, on, on this issue, and the state board is actually using a mach machine vote. So it would really be, you'd, you'd use a machine vote, and, and it, I, we believe, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, it's subject to the, to uh, be determined, but we believe that you would have to present a voter ID similar to voting on election day. So would the, your office object if we were to make that clear in this bill that an ID would re be required for again I think it's I think it's, I think it's our I think it's our belief that that the voter ID law would would apply to the way that we have we have proposed this this legislation this session as opposed Which to just belt and suspenders just in case it doesn't would it be okay if we included language in here that the same requirements of an ID that we have to provide on election day would apply to in-person early voting? I'm happy to take... I'm happy to take it back to the secretary, but again, I, I think that when we when we move this bill forward and, and look to have a machine vote, so the machine, machine uh, vote um, uh, process, that that we did b believe that you know the, that voter ID would be applicable in early with the early voting process. So, okay, cool. I'm, I'm take, glad to hear that. That's something I think I could definitely take that back. I don't. Yeah, I, I'll have to take that back. I, I can't speak for my colleagues. Secretary. I think that's something that I, I'd have to see to vote in the affirmative. Um, more generally speaking. I have concerns about early voting, and, and I would like to go back to 2016, if I could, please. Sure. Our primary was on 9-13-16. If we had early voting and we had emergency ballots that people are calling early voting, that would only give a candidate five weeks before voting started. I think that disenfranchises candidates without money that are out there knocking because a lot of people are going to be voting before that person has had an opportunity to knock on their door. Um, that, that's just a really big concern. I think it disenfranchises challengers and it, it empowers candidates that have money because they can send those advertisements out and um, effectively deny their opponent the opportunity to communicate with the constituent because many of those constituents, 46% you said are doing early voting? Nationally, the numbers are 46, right, 46% so of the voters, yep. If, if we get there, the vast majority of voters, not the vast majority, a large portion, 46% of voters are going to vote before election day is even held. And, and the nature of campaigns is that, I don't know, if you're a candidate, you plan your 10 weeks, you, you have a strategy. And, and I really think that early voting just throws a wrench in the whole thing. And uh, it's going to be difficult for people who don't have the resources 
to, to mount a successful campaign, especially for a statewide office, I might add, too. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, what we're seeing, again, is the numbers when, when the emergency, the, the ability to vote, again, I use quotes, an emergency, where there really wasn't any requirement to, de to, to, to denote an emergency in this past election, that we're seeing an increase uh, in voters. Again, you know, again, there was a little under 16,000, if I remember right, up from 5,000 in 2012, that that is going to continue. And, I th and, and we think, and you see it across the country in states that allow for early voting, that voters are, are looking to make that decision and, and vote in advance of an election, whether it be because they're going to be out of town, whether it means they're going to be working in one part of the state and may not be able to get to the other part of the state. So I, I hear what you're saying. It, what we're uh, And what the Secretary is putting forward is kind of a formalizing a process that we see, frankly, growing today, and that's putting stresses on the on the on the local on the local level and trying to put a little bit of more of a of a formal procedure in place to address some of those issues that have been that have been increasing over the last couple of elections. A, a statement and a question. And the, the statement is maybe we have to require emergency voting to actually be because of an emergency as opposed to this, you know, just go in and do it. Because um, really what we have now is not emergency voting. Um, how many states have early voting? There are, I, and I should have mentioned it. I provided a statement and I provided a, a, a one-pager. There are 33 states... Make sure I got this right when I uh, say it. Uh, 33 states in the District of Columbia provide some form of early voting. And, uh, without without an ex basically no excuse early voting, I should say, in person. And, and I, this is kind of a complex question, so I can understand if you don't have the information. If you don't have it, I, I'd like your office to provide it to the committee. How many of those states have such a, a truncated primary to general election time frame like us? I will double check that. I do not know the because time. I know there's a lot of states that out varies. there that, right. that they have their primaries in the spring, and then the general in November. I mean, our primary is late, so I like to see a comparison um, of states that have early voting when their election time uh, election days are. I will do that. I, I I know Massachusetts. I don't know exactly Massachusetts timing. I believe Massachusetts timing is a little bit closer to, to ours. They just instituted early voting uh, last year and saw about I I I want to I want to get the numbers right, but it was a it was about 30% of the of the eligible or 20 20%, 23% if I remember right of the eligible voting population voted early. But and I think their timing is similar to ours primary general, but I'll I'll get you numbers. I don't I don't want to quote anything without without having the, the accurate information. Thank you, Ms. Martesian. Sure. Representative Corvese. I would think that part of the evolution for this bill has come from the fact that allegedly emergency voting is no, no longer has um, any requirements, correct? That is correct. Okay. When did that, and, and in order to, uh, to continue oh, the discussion, when did that start and why? Or rather, when did not having excuses stop and why? So I, I'm, I'm not, Representative, I'm not, I, I'm not best to answer this question. Maybe someone from the, the local or the state board. Is, as I understand it, the, the state board this past um, election cycle, meaning 2016, made a statement, put out a statement that it formally that, that there was not an emergency required. I don't necessarily know the practice in the cities and towns over the prior election cycles, whether, whether, they, whether it was demonstrated that you needed to, to prove an emergency um, in order to vote early. I will, I, I'm sure someone from the state board or, or the, the so local So that was promulgated that. by the state board of elections? The, the determination was, was determined by the state board of elections. I wonder... Well, did they? I'm wondering if it violated any existing statute, or if the state board of elections needed some type of regulatory hearing to do something like that. Whether I'll or not it to. was within their purview or power to do that, and if it violated any existing existing election laws. I hope Common Cause would look into that. But having said that, I would have to dovetail on the comments of uh, Whip Filippi that. If this bill in any form were to um, get out of this committee alive, you're going to have to definitely uh, um, uh, put into writing uh, uh, that you need the same voter ID as you did. Now, I realize this is a minority of the populace who feels that voter ID is not necessary, but I believe a majority of the populace does. So 
seeing as how it's law that you need the ID on election day, it would only follow logically if you're going to vote beforehand, you need voter ID prior, if, if anything is going to come out of this committee. Would you agree with that? As I mentioned to Representative Filippi, I think we, I'll have to double check with the, with, the, with the Secretary on that. I think the intent when we put this forward and understanding that it was it changed this session with a machine vote is that voter ID would be, would be applicable in these situations. But I'll, I will definitely get back to you with Thank a final you. answer. I'm sure we'll discuss this ad nauseum. Uh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Representative McEntee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say first I am a big advocate for early voting. Um, I know it was two weeks prior this past election, I believe, that you could actually go in and uh, vote early. Is that correct? I believe it was the same 20-day 20 20-day process. I believe so. We, what we look to do, what we look to do here, um, Representative, um, is is to um, is to build off the same timeline that is in place today with the emergency mail ballot. So the time frame would not change. Oh. It would it would simply be a process, a formal process of in-person early voting in a location in particular city or towns. I do think that you have to get that 20 days straightened out in the bill because it, it, I was I was even asking him where does it say 20 days? I'm Absolutely, like, yeah, right. no, I, and that was that's the intent. And, so, and yes. like uh, Rep. Filippi said, there is a concern, you know, especially for a general election, uh, you get voted in in a September primary, and then you have till November, and 20 days of that is uh, early voting, and you're knocking on doors up until the very last day. So I can see it could be a problem in some instances, but if it'll get the people out to vote, it's well worth it. And the only other question I, I had was, is there any pu pushback from the cities and towns? Because obviously they're going to have to open up town hall on Saturdays and Sundays and pay overtime and all of that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering, I can, only, I can hear my town managers in my ear like, oh, well, this is going to cost us. But uh, I'm just wondering if you've heard that. We, we have, and, a, and you may have a correspondence, um, I, I believe. We, we continue to have conversations because we appreciate um, the, the potential increase in cost and why we're, we've structured this bill to hopefully alleviate some of those concerns. But we're willing to have discussions on is, is two weekends for a general too, too much. I mean, we're, I we're, we're absolutely willing to have those discussions to try to balance the, the interest. Well, of, maybe they could do it like after hours uh, during the weekday if that was well, enough we, to get people in. I don't so know. We're, yeah, we're, we'll, we're, we've had those conversations, and again, it's this is a this this bill. I, I, I won't. I, I, there are still concerns about the, some of the provisions of this bill. Obviously, you'll probably hear from some folks and receive some correspondence. I think what what you see here is is a is a product of a number of years and discussions with local officials in trying to address some of these concerns. Um, we also think that to the extent you have more folks voting early, that it's going to alleviate some of the stress and costs on Election Day, but that is a process as well. We completely, under, we completely, understand, we completely understand that. The, the only thing, you know, I used to be on the town council in South Kingstown, so when you open up a town hall and you're in the clerk's office, you can't put volunteers back there that you're just paying for Election Day like you can in the local schools or wherever you have your elections. So so it would require uh, employee, town employees to actually go in. So I'm just mentioning that because I, yep. I can hear it already. So, But I do appreciate early voting. I think it's a great thing, and it, it gets more people out to vote. So I don't want you to get a, the impression that I'm not for it. I certainly am. But thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Vella Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, following along with, with um, Rep. McEntee, I also am a very strong supporter of the concept of early voting. And I was just a, a bit concerned that there weren't going to be at least one or two evenings that would be available because we have so many of our constituents that are stuck in the lower paying jobs where they, they might not potentially be able to come in during the workday. So is that something that's still being considered? So that we left um, we, we we left the language as normal business hours um, during the week to to address some of the concerns about potential overtime. But there is language um, in here that allows for additional um, additional times to be provided 
and it, that's at the discretion of the of the cities or towns. Um, so yes, we 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 had thought about that, and and we you know the, the the two weekends, the weekend hours are 12 to 4. Again, trying to address some of the cost concerns. We initially thought, well, we'll just have 8 to 4 or 8:30 to 4:30, and there were concerns about staffing and costs. So there is, we think, some flexibility in here for cities and towns to use um, uh, to provide additional hours at their discretion if they believe there's an there's a the ability to do that and there's a need uh, in within their uh, the citizens in their city or town yes the section in the bill that you're referring to is on page four uh, lines seven and eight and so let me explain my concern with allowing just the municipalities to individually decide if they're going to provide any extra hours because if the decision is based on the cost then what's going to happen and uh, mr. Vincent I think that you'll appreciate where I'm coming from on this is that when you have a municipality that has a broader tax base they can afford to have extra hours and in some of the other municipalities where they can't where they have to make the decision based solely on the amount of uh, the cost for overtime, I think that it could potentially have a disparate impact on some of our communities. So I'm concerned about this. I like the bill, and I want to, like the rep before me, I want to be on the record as saying I'm very strongly in support of this bill. But I have some concerns over the fact that some of the more well-to-do communities might be able to afford to give extra hours, whereas some of our other communities that are living a little bit closer to the margin based on their lack of base for, for our property taxes is not going to have that afforded to their residents. It just doesn't seem fair. We understand that, uh, Representative. And the Secretary, I, I think, as you know, is interested in, in providing every opportunity for citizens across the state um, to, to, um, to, to express their right to vote and cast a ballot. Um, and we'll continue to work on this. The, the, the challenge, and Representative Hagan McEntee mentioned this, is always the balance between the increased costs on a local level and the access to persons voting. But we completely understand what you're coming from and, and agree, and we're happy to consider ways to, to see if we can structure this a little differently to address some of the concerns that you that you're raising and representative Hagen -Mack. thank you and dr. Cordes. representative Knight I just wanted to follow on the comments I'm all for uh, improving the law to improve voter turnout and voter participation but as I look at this I have two thoughts um, that are technical in nature but but somewhat problematic first thing is going back to the defined voting period of 20 days that really is an issue because you have it up top, you don't have it in the, and I'm not you, but in the bill. It's up top. It's not in the middle of the, where Representative Cor Corvesi pointed out, but it is in the section that talks about where municipalities can add if they, if they want to. It says during the early voting period. So that, that has to be fleshed out. Um, and, you know, I would throw out, too, as well, I mean, I appreciate having voting available from 12 to 4, but... I, you know, the, the citizen in me says, why are you going to make it hard? That's, that's just like, you know, the DMV, the old joke of the DMV. They're open, they're open 1 p.m. to 1.15 every third Tuesday except February. You know what I mean? It's like if you're going to have early voting, have early voting. Normal business hours, 20 days in advance, the weekends, 8 to 4, whatever it is. Um, I would suggest to the authors that if we're going to go down to this road, if we're going to go down this road, um, let's not.
Whoever's ready. Paul Grassick. Uh, chairman and committee, uh, I am going to uh, speak right now. My testimony applies to both uh, HB 5700, which is... No, the just, just 5700. We're not going to hear two bills at once. Okay, but it's the same testimony, so okay, I'm not fine. going to be here for the second one because it's the same that's testimony. That's very good. Just, I'm going to ask you to keep – we have a lot of witnesses signed up okay. on this bill, yep. so I'm going to ask you to, to yep. keep your – That's uh, fine. Uh, excuse me. Um, oh, hang, hang on. I'm not quite done yet. Please keep your testimony on this bill. Correct. Th thank you. It will be. Um, we are blessed uh, in this democracy uh, to be able to vote, and I wanted to start there. And I believe that anything that makes voting registration or voting easier uh, a good thing. Uh, so we should want more people voting. We frequently hear uh, dismayed comments when we hear how low uh, the uh, voter turnout is. And uh, I think this could improve that over time. Uh, we should want more people voting. I'm an educator. I've been a social studies teacher, uh, a curriculum director, a principal, and a superintendent during my career. And I've been at the heart of my teaching and at my administrative life has been <clears throat> promoting civic learning and civic responsibility. Um, it's what drives me as a teacher and an administrator. In ancient Athens, uh, the birthplace of democracy, people who did not show up to general assemblies to vote uh, were ostracized. They put red paint on them uh, so that they would be uh, indicated as people who weren't good citizens. And, uh, uh, and the word idiot uh, was associated with that idios, idiot. They were idiots for not participating when they had such a, such a right to participate and an ability to participate. Um, so it was very important then, and I think it should be very important now. Um, while I don't advocate that we should increase uh, 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 that we should increase the voter rolls by putting red paint on people, um, I do think we should find ways to encourage people to vote, and I think this does that. Uh, the history of the United States is the expansion of rights. Over and over again, we expand rights and opportunities. So I would say, let's make it easier to register to vote and easier to vote. We don't uh, have a holiday to vote uh, in this state, and uh, so let's provide uh, greater opportunity for uh, people to vote. Um, and I wouldn't mind if we had more uh, wrestlers in elective office either. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I also don't think this is incumbent protection. So thank you very much. Thank you, and um, you have submitted written testimony, so I understand it's Excuse doc me? You have submitted written testimony as well, correct? So I understand it's Dr. Krasik? Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, whoever's ready. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Steiner. I'm a student at URI, a graduating senior, God willing. And uh, I understand it's been a long evening, so I'll keep my testimony brief. Um, not only that, I'm, a, I'm also the grandson of a strong-willed Irish immigrant woman and a son of a Vietnam combat veteran, so the vote is a very strong uh, issue for me. Uh, when I came home from the Navy in 2011, I went to CCRI to finish my education or start my education, and I served as a veteran advocate, and CCRI being a, a commuter school, uh, I noticed a lot of people a lot of uh, veterans and civilian students alike had transportation issues. And I can't imagine having to use the RIPTA to get to class, oftentimes missing class, uh, how difficult it is um, to get to the voting booth those 13 hours on Tuesday in November, uh, myself having a car, being blessed with that. So I believe that some people, uh, some veterans especially, are being disenfranchised with those transportation issues. And also, um, I was one of the thousands who exercised that emergency ballot vote uh, last cycle. I went to my town hall, and I had complete confidence in the system. I presented my ID, and uh, they were very competent in their transactions. So I think that we should formalize this system uh, for further elections in the future, and I think it will be a good thing for democracy here in Rhode Island. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I get David. Uh, yes, um, I'm uh, David Leach, and I'm representing the Civil Rights Roundtable, which is a coalition of groups, all of which have as part of their agenda a civil rights component. Uh, we have submitted uh, a letter uh, addressing this bill and the automatic voter registration. I know this is uh, uh, seven, 5702. Uh, I just want to speak very briefly because we did submit something uh, that we are very concerned with the in integrity of the process of voting, but at the same time, uh, we wish to uh, congratulate the Secretary of State and encourage her in her efforts to open up the process and make voting easier for all citizens. Uh, we are all aware of what has happened in other states where there have been suits brought under the uh, Federal uh, Voting Rights Act, where attempts have been made to uh, cut short uh, voting hours, to reduce number of days of uh, early voting, uh, and do other things to uh, discourage uh, the vote. We are very pleased that this legislation would make it easier for people to vote and encourage people to vote. Uh, and I rely upon the statement that we submitted, but I just again wish to say that uh, we think this is a, a, a good start in improving our uh, system of voting and bringing it into the 21st century. Thank you, David. Any questions for these witnesses? Thank you very much. Could we hear from Jane Coster from the League of Women Voters, Doreen Dory Goodman from Common Cause, and Catherine Saunders from Providence? Okay, Kathy Saunders had um, signed up in support of this bill. I believe I just saw some written testimony from her as well. Welcome back to the committee, Jane. I'm the, um, representing the League of Women Voters of Rhode Island and president of the State League presently. We have actually had on our books since 1968, the League of Women Voters has to uh, participate in a study for all of our members and come to consensus on what we believe in. And since 1968, we have had a position on early voting. And of course, you know the history of the League in that uh, 100 years ago, the suffragists worked very hard to get uh, the vote for women. And we received that, and throughout our almost 100-year anniversary coming up in 2020, we feel that the right to vote is uh, something that is the most important foundation of what our country is. And any eligible citizen in this country should have that right to vote. Uh, and we also believe that it is most important that we make voting as easy as possible for any of our citizens in this country. And we have worked on task force with the Secretary of State here, and we are proud to do that and work with other good government organizations. And we believe in early voting. We support this bill. And for the sake of time here, I am going to uh, urge you to vote for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Any questions? Thank you very much. I'm Dory Goodman. I am chair of the uh, advisory council for Common Cause Rhode Island. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I'm here to urge you to support this bill. Uh, we are interested, and in, you know from John Marion, in this entire package of uh, reforms for voting, and we think it's a terribly important issue, and we are glad to know that you are considering it. Um, we suggest that there is one thing beyond what you have heard, and you have heard that um, some of these bills will make things more secure and more consistent. Uh, and provide greater accountability. I think that also 
a reform in terms of early voting will increase voter participation, but it will most of all, it will also increase faith in the system or the trustworthiness of the system. And I tell you a very short story uh, to emphasize my point, because mail ballots don't do the same thing, although they're increasing a great deal. People don't have the same kind of faith in the mail ballots. And I and my husband worked at the polls as poll watchers in Warren, where we live, uh, for the last election. And in the middle of the morning, the machine got overstuffed. And there was a problem, and nobody could feed in their ballots to the machine. And the warden, who was a very competent person there, said she would make a, an adjustment and she would collect all of the ballots that people had filled out. And then after the tech came, he would, she would feed them in. And people wouldn't do it. They hung around and they waited because they thought it was important that they put their own ballot in and that that, because they didn't trust the system. And I think that if we do early voting and we support this kind of thing and possibly uh, with the amendments, some of the things that have been discussed here today, that we will have a better system, that we will have less errors, that we will have accessibility for all people and that we will improve the trustworthiness of people actually being able to feed in their own ballot instead of using an emergency mail system. Thank you. Thank you, Dory. Any questions? Thank you both very much. Could we hear from Michael Beauregard from Young Democrats of Rhode Island, Dylan Conley, and Randall Rose? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of the committee for hearing uh, the testimony today. Uh, my name is Michael Beauregard, and I'm president of the Young Democrats of Rhode Island, and we fully support H5700 in in-person early voting bill. Uh, last year's election, we saw many cases of city and town halls being inundated with emergency mail ballots uh, being cast in the weeks leading up to the election, and in most cases, these were people who knew they could not vote on election day and would just wish to cast their vote early. H5700 would simply codify and appropriately name a process that already exists our st in our state. Uh, we know that once uh, one of the largest barriers to voting for many people is the inconvenience of showing up to the polling location on the day of the election, uh, and this bill will address that problem by providing them an alternate option. A uh, national survey recently of, uh, found that 35 percent of voters under the age of 30 who skipped uh, voting in the 2010 midterm elections said that they did not vote because they were too busy or had a conflicting work schedule. Uh, if this is the case, then it's an imperative for us uh, in the state uh, to do all we can to open access to voting and make people uh, able to vote early. Uh, both, I th believe, in-person early voting would strongly uh, increase the number of uh, young Democrats and young, young people in our state who can get involved in our electoral process. Uh, so I strongly urge the committee to consider passage of this bill uh, and you know, increase civic engagement young, amongst our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Randall? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, well, since people are talking about revising this, I will just mention um, the sentence at the bottom of page three going on to the top of page four. Um, that seems to have been put in inadvertently. It doesn't belong there. It should be deleted. Um, but that's very minor. Um, doesn't really affect the point of the bill. Um, okay, but now my actual testimony. Um, the important thing about this bill is um, that it makes things more convenient. Um, that's really the only um, overall effect of this bill, to make things more convenient. And you don't often hear government trying to do this, um, but this is one of the rare cases where you have a bill that would make things much more convenient. Um, and as the research shows, it doesn't mean that more people vote. It does not mean that more ineligible people vote. Um, it just makes things more convenient. Um, so that's what this bill is about. And um, the um, now, it is true that there is a lot of um, 
burden on the people who administer elections to make the election function. Um, but what the bill does is it's basically, for the most part, just rearranging the burden. Um, it's the same burden, just putting it at different points in the calendar um, have, and different places. Um, I suppose in a few cases it might, there might be a few extra costs, but for the most part it's just moving the um, burden to other places. Um, and it's... Um, and it, it does, I appreciate it. it really does take a lot to make an election come off successfully, and I appreciate the work of the people who, who do it, the volunteers and the paid people who do it. Um, and you can say impressive things about how much work it's going to be, um, but it's not as if this is making a whole lot of extra work. It's more rearranging the work. If, um, and we've seen in other um, states that other states manage to do this early voting period, and they don't have a great deal of problems. So I'm not talking about theoretical stuff. This is something that's been tried in many places and proven, um, and if we uh, and I think a lot of this is just kind of the status quo bias. If we were, if we had been um, it had a long history of having um, an early voting period, and then suddenly it was an issue of suddenly moving the election to all take place in one day, people would be like, "Oh, how are we going to manage all of this on one day?" But we manage it. Um, you can make scary statements either way, but we've it's been tried in both configurations and it's worked both ways. And for people who are concerned about possible errors um, by the um, election staff if you have it um, spread out over many days. I will just say, think about tax preparers. Um, tax preparers have a busy season kind of right now, um, and, they, uh, and of course it's important for them not to make errors, but they manage. Um, so even though they have a spread out period of a few weeks when people do submit a lot of taxes, they still do, it doesn't make them do a lot of errors. They, they adapt to it. I think our elections officials can do the same. Um, so, um, I just want to, so that's the effect of this, is making, it's um, rearranging the burden, but it um, doesn't do much else besides making it more convenient. Um, I do not, I know people can, and, and by the way, I am in favor of um, moving the primary earlier, which may have been kind of suggested before. I don't, um, if you want to move the primary earlier and have more time between the primary and general, then I'm fine with that. Um, but that's, that's not really part of this bill. If people want to add it, that's fine. Um, but aside from that, I don't think that moving the, that spreading out the election over more days is going to um, really affect how well informed people are. Um, I mean, it, um, superficially, there, I mean, there's a kind of um, the, um, plausible argument, there's kind of plausible sounding argument people can make that says, well, if people have to wait later to vote, then they'll be better informed, but we are not, you wouldn't have more informed voters if you moved election day to December 6th. Um, I mean, it's, um, if you have the election um, period starting earlier when people can cast a vote, then the um, campaigns will just put out their information more rapidly, and the people who already feel they can make up their mind will make up their mind. Of course, there's such a thing as people who vote and decide they made the wrong decision. I mean, I often vote and decide I made the wrong decision, but it's usually a few months after the election. Um, I don't think just um, affecting the day of the election and shifting it by a couple, uh, 20 days or so is going to make that much difference. Um, so it, um, it is, so I don't want us to um, be too resistant to changing the status quo when it's obvious that this is going to make it more convenient for people. And we're just behind other states in this. Other states have been willing to do this. Um, they haven't been too concerned about the extra burden on the administrative staff. Um, they've tried doing it. Um, and since they've tried doing it, we can look at what, they've, what their results were. Um, I mean, I'm very interested in hearing credible arguments that this is going to lead to more fraud, but a credible argument would mean looking at what happens in other states and showing that other states are experiencing more fraud. I haven't seen that evidence. I'd like to see credible ar arguments that other states um, that, that have tried this um, see an increase in incumbent retention or a decrease or whatever. Um, I don't see that evidence. Um, I think it, overall it, it may have positive or negative effects in some um, random idiosyncratic ways, but I don't see any overall effect in one direction or another except for the fact that it makes things more 
more convenient because that's what this bill is about. It makes things more convenient. This is something that people already do when they cast emergency mail ballots, um, but only a few people know about this. What this bill is doing is it's taking a process that's accessible only to a few people who know about the emergency mail ballots, and it's making it open to everybody. It's giving everybody the opportunity to um, vote when it's convenient for them, and that's good. That's what we should be doing. It, it really should does make it um, better for um, the, um, the people who have to actually do the voting, and they should be our first priority, making things easier for the people who do the first priority. And one good thing about taking the burden of um, administering an election and spreading it out over several days uh, is that you, do, you would not have so many long lines on election day, which I think is one of the biggest concerns people have. Um, with fewer people voting on um, that day, in, one day in November, um, there wouldn't be any, uh, there would be far less of a chance of having long lines at any one day when people come up to vote. So you could just come in, cast your vote, and leave, and that's the way it should be. Um, so I think this is an excellent bill, and I hope we pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Randall? Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. Um, Noreen Duncan from Pawtucket had signed up in favor. Uh, no testimony. Yanine Castito from the Providence Student Union had signed up in favor without testimony. Could we hear from Samuel Rubenstein, um, Jared Moffat, I don't see Jared, and uh, Emily Jones. Uh, Jared was in favor, as was uh, Su Susan Schlerick from the League of Women Voters. I hope I got that right. She's not speaking, but in favor. Uh, Sam? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, excited to be able to testify tonight. I'm here on my own, but also affiliated with a new organization that's getting started uh, at Brown, which is aiming to uh, get students down to the State House and get them active on, on issues uh, affecting the community. So I'm excited to be able to uh, represent that group uh, tonight. Um, I want to address group have a name uh, the Brown Political Act uh, Progressive Action Committee. Very good. Um, I want to address something uh, that you asked earlier, uh, Chairman Keeble, which is about uh, whether voters would be more informed, or I think you were generally getting at, like, what type of voter might take advantage of early voting. Uh, and I think that something that I haven't heard yet in this conversation tonight that's really important is thinking about what types of people are less able to vote under our current system who may be more able to vote under a different system. Right now, the working class in this state and country, uh, shift workers, are really burdened by our current voting system. Um, we do not have a national election holiday in this country, which I think is a serious problem. And as was pointed out, uh, elections on Tuesday uh, coming from agrarian roots. Uh, but when you have only one day to vote on a weekday, when people are expected to be at work or in class, or you know, people working late night shifts are not able to get up early in the morning to be at the polls, that's a serious burden on people, uh, you know, affecting young people, affecting uh, racial minorities, lower income folks, and uh, the voting franchise should be just as accessible to them as well. So I think that the, yeah. So I don't understand what that has to do with whether or not they're informed. So what it has to do with is that if you had an early voting period, people would have more flexibility to be able to find a time that works for them. So if they have That a, goes to the issue of convenience, not to, not to the issue of whether they're informed. So what I'm saying is that without an early voting period, if you're a shift worker and you are not getting out of work... So you that, agree with me. It goes to the issue of convenience, not how well they're informed. No, I think it also goes to being able to vote, period, not just convenience. You may not be able to vote, period, if you are not able to get out of work to vote on voting day. Okay, you may not be able to vote, period, if, if you have a job that requires you to be at work during a traditional... I think traditional... that that's a public prob policy problem. Okay, but it doesn't go to the issue of whether or not they're informed. You would agree with that. It doesn't go to the issue of them being informed. Thank you. I think it goes to who is able to vote, though. What demographics of people in our society are able to vote? I, I, I agree, but you right. started off by saying it was about whether or not they're informed, and then you talked about something else entirely different, and I just wanted to point that okay. out. So please continue. I apologize. Um, something else that I wanted to raise uh, is that uh, we have an opportunity now in Rhode Island to be a leader, which is something that excites me, and I, I, hope, I think that sometimes we're afraid of 
but we should be, we should grasp it. Um, right now in this country, uh, voting rights are really being rolled back uh, with uh, you know a, a, aggressive efforts in other states to drive down voting participation, uh, uh, to to gerrymander districts, uh, all sorts of pernicious uh, policies that uh, you know aim to uh, predetermine an outcome of an election. I think that by passing this reform in Rhode Island, we have an opportunity to lead uh, the way for other states. And we have our neighbor now in Massachusetts having just done this. We have Connecticut looking to do the same thing and having the same conversations that we are. I'm afraid that if Rhode Island doesn't take up this mantle soon, it could ultimately be left behind. I want to address a point that was made by Representative Filippi. I wish that he was still here. Um, which is the, the question of, a, of an incumbent protection program with this. I, I don't necessarily believe that that would be the case, but I also want to suggest maybe more provocatively that I'm not sure that it matters. Um, I think that it would ultimately be a good thing for our society if both incumbents and challengers had to structure their campaigns around getting people to vote. If they had to devote a larger share of their expenditures to their get out the vote operations and less to ads, mailers, et cetera, et cetera. If, 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 if we have a system in which the advantage goes to the candidate that is better able to get people out to vote, I think that is ultimately a good thing for all of us, um, regardless of whether that is the challenger or the incumbent. And I think that either one is, ca is capable of doing that. Um, finally, I, I want to, with this issue of uh, the primary, I want to point out that in the last cycle, the turnout for the Rhode Island primary was like 8%, 11%. It was ridiculous. It was pathetic. Um, and I, I think that this is perhaps a good opportunity if there is legitimate concern about having a long voting period for the primary in September up against a long pri You know, how do you rethink the primary? I want to suggest more provocatively, outside of the scope of the legislation before you today, that other states are innovating on, uh, on the way that they do primaries, and that Rhode Island could, for instance, eliminate its primary altogether and go with a ranked choice voting system in which people would go to the polls once, they'd say, this is my top choice candidate, this is my next choice candidate, and when it's tabulated, it would automatically knock off the candidates that don't get enough votes until one has a majority, and regardless of party, you would, you'd, you'd get that done with one high turnout, well-administered election, not a low turnout, you know, uh, mess. So I think that I think all of this is is a good conversation to be having. You know, I think most of what you do here as legislators is the outputs of the government process, making policy. But we're talking about is the inputs. How do we how do we input our preferences into the system? And if we're not getting that right, and I'd argue that the system right now, with very low turnout and inaccessibility to lots of types of voters, is not getting it right, that's something that you should prioritize in terms of your legislative efforts. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, Emily Jones from the Rhode Island Interfaith Coalition uh, submitted written testimony in favor. Uh, Georgia Hollister Isman from uh, the Working Families Group. Uh, Karen Alzati from NLC signed up in favor without testimony, as did Naomi Leopold. Um, David Oppenheimer from North Kingston signed up in favor without speaking. Um, Catherine Sanders, uh, we had her earlier. She is in favor. Um, actually, let me ask. Let me ask. Is there anybody left in the hearing room that is signed up to testify? Please come up. Okay, Georgia. Did I? How did I do on that name? It's Isman. Isman. Okay. Like a Z. Yeah. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, we are, I'm the state director for Rhode Island Working Families, um, and we care about the priorities of working men and women in Rhode Island, and one of those priorities is to be able to meaningfully participate in their democracy. We think this bill makes that easier, um, especially the aspects of it that allow people to vote, not just during regular work hours, but on weekends um, and over a period of time. 
time in advance of the election. Uh, we think this will make the people who actually show up to vote for all of you a more representative sample, um, better sample of the people who care about what happens here in this building. Um, and we think we ought to make it easier for them to be part of that process. Okay, thank you. Any questions? How are you? Welcome to the committee. If you could just identify yourself so I could find you on the list. Me? It doesn't matter. Oh, Lynn Aiken, A-K-I-N, East Providence. Um, I am supporting this bill. Um, I've been a moderator warden in my district since 2004, so that puts in 16 hours a day, nonstop, can't leave the polling place. So the work itself, you are on top of your game. So that's really not an issue for extended Actually, I'd be really thrilled if I only had to work for those few hours, um, but that's beside the point. Um, I'm also an hourly worker, and so this would definitely make my life a lot easier and also make my, my colleagues' lives a lot easier to be able to get to vote instead of having to either take a vacation day, take a sick day, try to manage babysitting for the kids. So I strongly, strongly encourage you to vote for it. Um, I'm on Rhode Island. I moved here in July of 2016 and voted in my first election here in November. It was great to see such a high turnout on election day, but it was unfortunately the very high turn turnout kind of overwhelmed the staff and as well as voters at my polling place, which was Temple Bethel on Orchard Avenue in Providence. Um, there weren't really enough workers to keep the line moving, and there was only one ballot machine. And as a result, many people, including myself, waited two hours just to get a ballot and then waited at least another hour to get that ballot into the ballot counting machine. And I did not have to go to work that day, so I was able to wait, and that was fine with me. It's worth it to get to vote. But I did actually observe a lot of people leaving without voting, and people would just kind of peel off from the line, you know, after an hour, after an hour and a half. And, you know, you'd be chatting, you'd hear the comments, and people would say they had to get to work. You know, they, they couldn't miss work or... I'm a lawyer. I, I'm supposed to be meeting my client in court. I have, you know, appointments. I, you know, just I have to be at work. And some people said I have to take my mom to the doctor. You know, I just heard all kinds of things, and I saw people leaving without voting, which is very unfortunate. Um, and I believe if this early in-person voting bill had been in place, that there would not have been such a crowd because it would have been spread out over the 21 days or however many you may decide to come up with. So no one would have had to leave their polling place without voting. I talked to friends and relatives in states who have early voting, such as Florida and California. Almost all of them voted early, and they said, what? Why didn't you vote early? I said, oh, well, we, we don't really have that here. <laughs> And uh, I th think also it would be helpful for the election day staff because they were doing their very best and they were very nice, but they were frankly overwhelmed by the crowds so that they really couldn't do things that needed to be done to kind of tweak the lines and fine tune and keep things moving. And also some people then would get up to the ballot and find out there was a problem with their registration. I, f I feel if they had been able to vote early, that might have been taken care of and there wouldn't have been all that stress and problem on the voting date. So um, I support the bill for those just reasons that I've observed, and I hope that um, you'll help to make voting a little bit fairer and easier in Rhode Island. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Vice Chair Agello. Thank you, Chairman Keeble. Uh, Sheila, I am Representative Agello, your representative, and I spent a good deal of time on Tuesday uh, outside Temple Bethel in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. And it was quite a mess in the morning. And it got worse, for those of you who don't know, because people held on to their ballots rather than putting them in a bag or something mm -hmm. to be counted later or handled by the poll workers. They held on to their ballots, and that meant that the ballots got bent a little bit soggy from hand sweat, and then they jammed up the machine. So it, it things kind of cascaded for a while until the, until another sh machine came. In the end, things were very quiet late in the afternoon and the in the evening, and people were able to walk in and walk out pretty quickly. But it, it was quite a mess in the morning. Yeah. Part of that, I think, was the new machines. And hopefully in 2018, things will go much smoother for you and the other people at Temple Bethel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Any further comments, questions? Thank you. The, um, Bethany Foster had signed up in support. Eve Kobish Hank. Uh, Laura Leschich had signed up in support. Aaron Olson in support. Leanne Byrne from the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless was in support. Tom Bersaford uh, was in support. Lee Clasper Torch was in support. And Rebecca Neves McGoldrick was in support. Was there anybody else that wanted to testify on House Bill 5700 by Representative Blazajewski? Mr. Chairman, I have a question for perhaps the representative of the clerks or perhaps a representative from the Secretary of State's office or someone from the Board of Elections. Would there need to be at wherever votes are being cast with early voting, would there need to be a vote counting machine, a tabulator for every precinct that was voting there? Could could someone come up and, and testify? Jason, you want to? Welcome back. If you could just identify yourself again yeah. for the record. Bob Raposa from the State Board of Elections. The answer to your question, Rep, would be that there would be one tabulator in the location of the early voting center, and the ballots would be created from what is, what is referred to as a ballotar, and the ballot would be created once the voters signed in using the electronic poll pad. So you would see the precinct, and then the, the ballot would be present, uh, created for the voter. And then how is that ballot counted? Is there one tabulator or whatever the machine is called that... The tabulator would read all the precincts for the, that community. So let's say you were in North Providence and there were 18 precincts. There would be 18 different ballot styles, but each ballot style would be accepted by the same voting machine, and it's recorded on the the USB that then at the, on election night would be transfer, uh, transferred uh, via Wi-Fi to the state network. Thank you. Okay, now I have a question. Okay. That raises a question with me. Um, Mr. Martesian, could you come back up, please? You should put in for a raise yes, with the sir. secretary. When she, um, that sound, correct me if I'm wrong, but we just the state just bought all new election equipment the last election cycle. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. He, it sounds like he's talking about completely new. Do we have to do new election equipment again? No. No, that's the, I, just I, the I Deloitte printers we have to buy? We no, have. these. so there are, I, 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 there are on demand uh, on demand ballot printers that we per, that we purchased with the along with the voting equipment. Oh, you already purchased this stuff? Correct. That was all. That was, that was all, presumptuous of you, that don't was, you think? Well, no, we use those. They, the, the cities and towns as well as the state use those this year to save some money. Frankly, we didn't need to print as many, if I remember right, mail ballots because you can print basically on demand. The printers are able to print them as necessary. Um, so that w over time, I think we'll be able to save some costs and we may have saved some some printing costs uh, in this past election cycle. So it was all part of the, it was all part, good of, the, answer, Mr. It was all part of the purchase, good Mr. Rest Chairman. It was all part of the purchase. All part of the purchase. Okay. Any? Uh, oh, nope. okay. one more. Mr. Price. <laughs> yeah. So it prints the ballot out. So the person comes up and shows their ID, gets confirmed that they're the person they are. It prints the ballot up. The ballot goes in the machine and is counted and stored. That is correct. So there's the ballot. Well, they have to vote the same way. You you vote this ballot the same the same, same thing the mm -hmm. same way as you would in in the polling location. If that's the question, is yep. that right? Yeah. That is correct. It would go into a machine similar to that in each of our polling places. So it's the same process on the same on, machine. Only there, each machine is pro, is programmed to accept all the ballots from that community. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Representative Corvese. Let's take that information and work backwards. So now on election day, when I go into my particular voting uh, poll, my 
my ballot has, let's say, mayor, uh, Senate, certain Senate district, rep district, council district, school committee district. Mm -hmm. There's a machine there, and there's either 18 or 17 districts in North Providence. 18. So when we, when I put that into the machine, is that machine the same as every other machine in the, in the town? No. The machines at all the other precincts are only programmed for that particular precinct. Can those machines be reprogrammed for other districts? I don't, I don't understand. Well, so you answered a third of my question. So the particular voting machine that accepts my ballot is specifically programmed for the ballot I'm putting in. In the polling place. In that polling On election place. day. And up the street at Wayland School, <laughs> where there's another district. That's programmed for that precinct. That's, okay. Each particular precinct, let's call it, this sub-district, what have you, is specifically programmed for the ballot it's receiving. Correct. Can those machines be reprogrammed for other cities and towns? For a, a different, well, they're all being used on the same day. I understand that. But in other words, f for 2014, a particular machine was at my polling place. Mm -hmm. Now, for 2016, could that machine be reprogrammed and placed somewhere, somewhere else? Because it's not the machine. The machine is, accepts the ballot based on the a device that is entered in the machine that's been so programmed. So the ballot has to ref So the machine's program has to reflect the ballot that's going in. That's correct. That's two-thirds of the question. So now... Let's go forward. So what you're saying is for the early voting period, with the exception of Election Day, up until 12 p.m. on Monday, the day before, there'll be one particular machine in a town or city which will be programmed on a master basis for every voting, for every office in that particular town. That is correct. So then that way there, when any voter from any of the precincts from 01 through 18 goes into, let's say, North Providence Town Hall, they sign in on the poll pad, the ballot top prints their ballot, which is identifiable by a precinct, the voter votes it, and then it's placed into the, the uh, voting machine. And then at 12 p.m., the, the pumpkin turns into a coach, and we have all the 18 different uh, voting machines in the 18 separate precincts in North Providence, all programmed for the particular ballot that's used on that day. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, any further questions? All right, that will conclude oral testimony on House Bill 5700 by Representative Blazajewski, early voting. We have a significant amount of written testimony. Governor Raimondo writes Hello. over her signature in support of the bill. The Rhode Island League of Cities and Towns does not support passage. Working Families supports passage. Dr. Grazik supports passage. The Rhode Island Town and City Clerks Association, Louis Cirillo, right to express some concerns and for the committee members there are some nice bullets there that lay out the clerk's concerns. Uh, the Rhode Island Interfaith Coalition is in favor. Sheila O'Connell is in favor. The League of Women and League of Women Voters is in favor. Um, Councilwoman uh, Dr. Kalman from Pawtucket is in favor. The ACLU is in favor. Uh, the Secretary of State, Nellie Gorbea, um, submitted a written statement in support. She has also given us um, written um, talking points in support. The City of Pawtucket Town Clerks, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Registrar, Kenneth McGill, writes in support. The Rhode Island Civil Rights Roundtable writes in support. Uh, Dory Goodman um, writes in support. 
Catherine Saunders writes in support, and Common Cause Rhode Island writes in support, Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless writes in support. And not included in your packet because it was sent to me at my house is a letter from the town clerk of North Smithfield who is uh, very opposed to the bill. I will make sure that that gets in uh, the committee members' folders. Uh, I apologize for not bringing that in. Representative Corvese. Mr. Chairman, can I ask one more question, sure. please? And this would be of the gentleman from the Board of Elections. Bob, come on up on the, on the bill that just won't die. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you for your indulgence, and I thank you for your patience. Um, who does the programming of the individual machines that receive the voting um, the voting ballots. The programming is done by the vendor election system and software uh, under the ballots that they receive from the uh, layouts that they receive from the Secretary of State's office. And then the Secretary of State's office then approves the ballots along with each city and town. Who's the vendor? Election system and software out of Omaha, Nebraska. And they program all the individual machines? Yes, they do. Is there someone here, and I know this is, is there someone, so is there someone here presently on election day from that organization or people from that organization to troubleshoot Absolutely. on that day? Absolutely. How many people you figure? They have, it, they have at least one person here and they bring people in to support. You contracted for that? We are. Would that contract have to be extended for the 20 days? No. Sure? I'm sure. So we're not going to have any trouble with the 20 days. Boy, you're an optimistic guy. I'm optimistic. But that's why you're in government. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that will conclude testimony on House Bill 5700.